Thank you. It's a very nice chance to come and talk to you. Um, uh, as we've just seen, I'm in the aeronautics department, which in some sense might seem a bit strange to be coming talking to you guys. Uh, although in you reflect a bit on the history of Imperial, the bioengineering department, one of the divisions, the Physiological Flow Studies Unit, used to be placed immediately on top of the aeronautics department. So that's kind of always given us a great synergy. Another criticism I've sometimes had of working in this area is that you need to not only understand mechanics and physics, but a bit of biology might not go amiss. Now, I, I am slightly uh, uh, weak on that side, but my strategy is to hook up with somebody else, which I should mention, Peter Weinberg, who's the more on the physiological and the biological side, to keep me on the straight and narrow. So what I want to try and describe, without any equations, I promise I have one equation, but I, 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 I've got a cartoon to go with that, is just to motivate why, what is this field about CFD and how has it related and shaped our thought process of uh, uh, how we might apply it to understanding of atherosis. So that's kind of my, my plan. That's the algorithm bit in the middle, and here are some of the examples of some of the, the blood flow. So if we start in this broader context uh, of applications of fluid mechanics and where it might be useful, what might start with this first question, if my going to forward for me. I'll have to click the button. Oh, here we go. Okay, what links this? This, this gives us my indication of the diversity of the fields that I get to study, which kind of come out to fluid mechanics. Here's a, an image on the, on the bio side, of course, is, is a, a, a mouse heart. Uh, maybe not so uh, uh, familiar to you is this middle image of uh, offshore oil extraction. In order to get oil out of the subsea surface in these great depths, they have the, these tankers and carriers very far up, and there's a lot of these pipes that, of course, it, both extract the oil and the fluid from, from the seabed to the top, and there's a current that goes over top of it, and that current actually causes the, the pipes to vibrate a lot, and there's a concern to the offshore engineering. And the last part that you're alluding to, so for the last, well, maybe 10 or 15 years, I've worked quite closely with, uh, 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 with a different racing team, actually, McLaren Racing. I thought I'd, <laughs> I used, he used to be in McLaren, this guy, but I put him out there all the same. So uh, one of the facts I like from the Formula One industry is the difference between being first uh, and 10th is a one to two percent difference in aerodynamic performance. That's the tolerance of which they like to work with, and that's why they're kind of interested in getting everything they can out of their fluid mechanics. So my group, we've developed these methodologies for solving uh, uh, fluid mechanics on, uh, uh, on computers, computational fluid dynamics, uh, sometimes otherwise known as co colorful diagrams, which this slide partly illustrates. What we're seeing here is this range of some of the activities. These are these flows on the top, we could say, is relatively slow flows, speed, fluid mechanics that's slower than the speed of sound. Uh, this was the example of offshore engineering. This was more motivated by flow over aircraft, where they're interested to have laminar smoother flow on the aircraft to reduce drag. And this one, of course, at least looks like the kind of Formula One type topics, where, where although they go very fast, they're very noisy, murky flows, and they're trying to work out how they control all those vortices. But today, the ones that I'm going to focus on, well, mainly this area of the cardiovascular flow, we're going to apply exactly the same algorithms to, to solving the, the electrical wave signals are, are on the atrium in this example. So our, our building blocks are very similar. Why have I got these separated at the bottom? Well, these are actually to do with compressible flow, flow that can travel faster than the speed of sound, which is kind of more of an aeronautic topic. The fascination to me, which I won't go to too much today, is the, the guy that wrote the original equation for fluid mechanics that we teach our undergrads all the time, Euler, he didn't write down his equations for gas dynamics as we would now apply it, and indeed all our undergrads would think that's the reason. He wrote it down for blood flow. He was interested in the, 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 the vessels, the blood flow through the uh, uh, systemic system. And so, so that's how I'm going to link them together. So, oh yeah, so the last part of the story is, okay, uh, 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 this is my evolution of computational power through, through, through my, from my childhood. This is a, a, a ZX81. For those of the older in the audience, they might have had this. The ZX81, the one referred to 1K of memory that we used to have, and we'd have to attach it to a, a, a VDU screen and a tape recorder. When I first became an academic here, this is the machine they bought me. Your, your, your iPhone might be more powerful than that now. And the kind of computers we've now got available in this evolution of perhaps 30 years, of course, these supercomputers that we actually never see these days, right? I mean, Google, they have these massive uh, computational resources which we access remotely. What that's allowed us to do, of course, is develop the software under sign. Part of my message is it's okay having lots of computational power. We've got to have the methods and the algorithms to go with it. So again, in my use, the most exciting uh, video game we had was this tennis game that used to go back up and down. 
midway through, of course, we got these kind of graphics, uh, uh, an online gaming forum, and even uh, uh, in this period, some 10, 20 years ago, Doom came back out. And now we barely think about it. We've got our iPhones, we've got our iPads, and there's so much software there. Ashfat, uh, another role I play for the university is as a director of research computing service. And one of our challenges is going back and now and filling in some of the gaps of, because we didn't have to struggle so much learning the algorithms at this point, we expect everything to be in an app. But when we want to change the app, how, how do we go about doing that? Where, where is that, that knowledge gap and how do we fill that in? So before I talk about the algorithms, this, 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 this cartoon is what I do in reality. It's trying to make very high fidelity, highly accurate uh, uh, variants of this CFD algorithm. And I've struggled for 20 years, even to my own community, to try and explain and motivate this. And the, the best example I've got to come up with is this one. In this solution, the real solution, the physics of the problem, it should look like this. It should go round in a circle and it should remain like a cone. When we discretize these problems, these unsteady problems on the computer, what can happen, and this would be more indicative of the kind of standard commercial software you can get, this, this cone very rapidly smooths or smears out on the computer because of the way we're, we're, we're approximating it. Now we can play around with smarter algorithms and have, if you like, the same uh, uh, number of uh, a, a, a piece of information that we represent the solution with, but you can see in this bottom uh, right-hand corner, we get something that looks much more like a cone. So as we want to study unsteady flows, like the fluid mechanics of the human body, uh, we need to make sure we have these scales, the important scales of our problems, looking like they were uh, the, the real solution, and not smearing out and causing us our errors and our problems when we, when we get back to look at the, the, the final answer. And I'll come back to that in my conclusion. So where does this all overlap into the, the cardiovascular system? So if I start, one of the challenges or one of the abilities these days is to take images. This is actually a micro CT scan of the vasculature of a rabbit. And from that, what we can do is extract this pipe in all its uh, 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 detail and geometry. So uh, when your introduction, you mentioned how different the fluid mechanics is uh, inside the body to our plumbing examples. If you've ever looked underneath your sink, what you'd expect a junction of a fluid is it comes out at 90 degrees, it's very easy to manufacture and stick together. Here, if you go and uh, scan in these beautiful geometries, they come off at different angles, and then they've got kind of very smooth uh, 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 junctions and branches between them. Now, some of the requirements here is how do we feed the rest of the body? There's certain constraints where the vessels have to go, but we can also go ask why are there any fluid mechanic advantages to these kind of shapes and patterns? So if we take these images, I don't know what's happening, oh, we go to that slide, and we can simulate the swirliness, if we like, of the blood flow. And why might that be of interest in the, 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 uh, to cardiovascular and cardiovascular disease? Well, it's been known, and this is kind of stemming into Peter Weinberg's side, that the, the, the suspensions in the blood, like lipids, can accumulate in lo very localized regions around this, this cardiovascular system. So where we have branching and swirly flows, we seem to see a preponderance, a buildup of, of fatty plaques that then leads to the diseases like atherosis. So what's that? our challenge is what's the connection between this complex fluid mechanics uh, uh, and this potential complex uh, biology? So what I want to do from that is step back and highlight a study that uh, a couple of the PhD students of Peter's eye have done over the last five, ten years, and where it kind of fits into offering a little bit more insight into this big picture. So in order to do that, we've got to say, what, what were the prevailing theories relating uh, atherosis, this disease of the arteries, to wall shear stress? Well, wall shear stress is the traction, the stickiness of the fluid as it, uh, as it scoots along the artery walls, like if you slide your hand over, uh, uh, over your other hand, you feel that pressure. So the fluid mechanics can do the same thing. And right back, well, I, since my, I'm, I'm 50 this year, so I know what year this was 50 years ago. The first theory was high wall shear stress. So Fry came up with the idea that if this traction force is really, really high, what it could do is damage the surface of the artery walls, and then that would allow the lipids to accumulate over the other side of it. But just two years later, in fact, Colin Caro, Colin Caro uh, is still here at, at Imperial College, he put forward a, a, a counter hypothesis that it was actually the low wall shear stress that's causing the problem. So what was the thought process behind that? Who was sort of saying, well, a certain level of uh, uh, wall shear stress, or our, our blood has to pump all the time, it must be exposed to this shear stress all the time. Maybe it's regions where the blood moves really, really slowly. So when the blood is moving slowly, you have low uh, attraction forces, and that allows potentially the suspensions to cross over the artery wall and cause this disease pattern. So 
Those were the two prevailing initial arguments. Like all good academic communities, we sit there and argue a lot. Uh, and this is the one that's maybe won out. I think if I ask the clinicians, they will have heard of the low shear stress uh, uh, theory more than the high shear stress. And there's a one that comes a little later on in 1985, which is called oscillatory shear stress. So if the flow, it should be, it's unsteady, it's pumping. What happens is it matters if it goes backwards and forwards. Does that have an influence on this disease? So these two things together we're going to call the low and oscillatory shear stress hypothesis. Now what I like about going back on this study is, well, how much did we actually know or believe about these theories? They've been around now for 50 years. Uh, I think I'm right of presuming that the, the clinical practitioners will be familiar with the low shear stress. And to my mind, it's almost become a, a law, a factual statement. And it may yet still be true, but there's, uh, do we have much evidence to support that? This study which was one of our students, uh, Veronique Pfeiffer. She went away and looked on the internet, if you like, take off how many, how many papers are there out there that link atherosis, link this idea of shear, the stickiness of the blood flow, and have some sort of simulation of the complex flow to say where, where things are high or low. So to begin with, there were nearly 400 of those papers. Then there were various reasons why, why they wouldn't necessarily be related to the question we're asking. Was it a review paper? Uh, was it not related to the idea of atherosis growing? Was there no CFD to compare a disease pattern to, to the actual CFD? And eventually you should get down to just 27 papers. So it's quite surprising for this first period. This is now six, five, six years ago. There'll have been a bit more research in between, but that's, that's the state of the play then. Uh, and they came from various sources. The majority are fortunately human. We have some from the pigs and rabbits uh, 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 and mouse. Uh, and predominantly coming from the coronary system. So what kind of studies were they doing? What were they looking to, to correlate? Were they, it, when they looked at the details of the studies, they said, am I trying to compare one dot, one bit of, of, of stickiness of the flow with one bit of disease? There's a whole series of papers that did that. That's actually very, very hard to do, and that's beyond, I would say, the fidelity of any of our tools today. So another approach is, well, if I take a strip of this vessel and I average it over a small region, does that correlate to where the disease was, with where the flow was? And there's different ways of averaging it. Or if I just say that uh, half the levels, like I can take the peak shear stress and the minimum shear stress, and I just want to see if what's below the halfway point correlates with disease or not. Or give up everything else, I just, just visually inspect, see if there's any connection. So those are kind of the, the levels of uh, interrogation they made. And this was the state of play of our understanding at that point. It was very difficult, impossible, to put a point-by-point -point, uh, 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 um, assessment of this correlation, find this correlation. So there were just no correlations if you do the point-by-point. -point. This idea of looking at regions and averages is a bit, a bit better, but there's still some sort of ambiguous yes or no. The most likely uh, correlation really came from visual inspection, because that's not terribly rewarding, because we can be a bit subjective when we're deciding what's high or low. So, Although this is, might stand out by standing as, do I think the low shear stress hypothesis is wrong? It's no. Our question is really, have we got sufficient information to start answering this question? So the next stage of our study was to go back and say, have we asked the right question, or do we have full information even about the mechanics, the physics and the fluid mechanics of our, our situation? So to motivate that, I want to consider these three cases. If I've got my fluid mechanics, and if the flow is just pulsing but doesn't reverse on itself, then I might end up with this kind of pattern. Conversely, I could have a slightly more complicated region where it might pulse and the flow could go back on itself and reverse backwards and forwards. It's not unreasonable. But you can see here from my diagrams, we're thinking very one-dimensionally here. The actual other piece of the puzzle is, well, may maybe, depending on where I am in that complex fluid mechanics or structure, the flow can change its directions as it sweeps back and round. So, one of our, our, our statements or hypotheses about this, this study is that if we just take the average of the flows, these three cartoons have exactly the same properties here. Okay, the average of it going backwards and forwards deliberately by those three, three the diagrams have exactly the same values. There was this oscillatory shear index, and it has been used quite widely to study, and that at least recognized the idea that maybe it's important whether the flow goes backwards and forwards. So are the cells being exposed to what you might presume is reasonably good forward flow, because the blood has got to pump through the system, but when it goes back on itself, they don't like that very much. And these other two indices were at least able to distinguish between this fully forward flow and the flow reversal. And kind of the bit of the puzzle that I want to point out, which seems so simplistic now, is, well, when we draw the cartoons, we've got to remember stuff can wiggle sideways. And these, these 
identities, his way of identifying the, the metrics of shear, weren't able to distinguish between this flow or this flow. Okay, so our, our contribution or our insight in this work, here's my one equation, was to say, well, how can we characterize the idea that stuff goes sideways as well as backwards and forwards? So what we did is we say, you take this flow, you have to identify which direction it's flowing in and take its mean. And then we, what we're going to do is take that uh, uh, um, sideways moving flow and add up each of the vectors. So I got this flow. I have my cartoon going round at different angles. And what we measure here is how much moves laterally or, or uh, right angles to the mean direction of the flow. Okay, that's the, the, the property that we put into our transverse wall shear stress. And does that allow us any more insight? Well, the first thing we can notice, notice we can distinguish between these two flow regimes. Okay, so not just stuff going backwards and forwards. This lateral motion gives us some way of identifying that. So here's a, a study. What we're looking at here is the aortic arch that we've done these. The, we've done a scan, and then we've simulated the fluid mechanics, and we've unrolled the aortic arch here. Uh, and Peter tends to study these intercostal, these small branches that come off the, the descending aorta. And what you see is this very clear streaky patterns, which at the largest level certainly correlate pretty well with this macro type features. So I'm more confident if you're going to challenge me at the end what do you think we could correlate our, our flow patterns with and the disease to this level of feature. But what we're really interested in where Peter's type focus is what about the patterns between different branches? Do we get this, this different accumulation of, of the lipids or the early onset of the disease? Peter uh, has looked a lot about the aging process, so he's very keen on looking at immature and then mature patterns of disease. And we're able to do notably better, at least, than the other metrics by looking at this lateral type motion of, of the arteries. So in this case, you see we have a, a statistical difference between identifying what were the patterns of this uh, uh, lateral motion of the shear stress with the disease pattern for both mature and immature versus if I take the, the average, the low shear hypothesis, if we like, I was only able to find a, a statistically meaningful uh, correlation with the immature type vessels. So it gives us some hope. I'm presenting you the best pictures at the moment. I'm going to come back and saying there are all these other uncertainties. But at worst case, when we talk about mechanics or we talk about going down the road, we don't want to just move in one direction. It makes complete sense. You should make sure you can turn left and right and understand where that might be opening up your your, your overall picture. So I think, hopefully, I, I'm roughly on time. I wanted to end with one image with this. This is a, uh, this has nothing to do with me, but I, it's kind of a nice story of relating computational fluid dynamics and interclinical practice. I would say my stuff is much more on the kind of the, the fundamentals and understanding the details of the fluid mechanics, but there are other ways you might apply it. And this initiative, uh, uh, by this guy, he's the, the founding uh, 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 of this, this, this company called Heartflow, Charlie Taylor. He, if you could read this, was uh, his PhD was in uh, computational fluid dynamics. I know it's about the same time as I was doing my PhD, so I've seen him grow this career before. Uh, and what he's done is taken these type of tools, integrated them with imaging, and tried to do patient-specific estimates of whether or not you should have an invasive procedure. They've recently got a nice accreditation. And I suppose this would be, for me, one of the first examples of somebody wanting to engage very, very closely with the clinical community and try to develop uh, 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 tools that you can actually use in practice versus the other side of it that I put is how do we understand the building blocks of the biology and disease and, and the fluid mechanics put together. So my summary and confessions. OK, so I've shown you 50 years, 50 years of hypothesis. Uh, so it was only five or 10 years ago that we went to look at the, the lateral type motion. And what was maybe most uh, uh, amazing to me is why on earth didn't we spot that before? I, I, like everyone else, you get, you get told this is our understanding in the direction we look in. And it tends to drive us sometimes just to look in one direction. And it's it's very helpful, but it usually takes a while for you to do to step back and say, OK, where is the information complete? Of course, we've got to have a combination of this fluid mechanics, the computational fluid mechanics, imaging, biology, and physiology. And so there are many different angles that can help rather uh, obscure our understanding of these problems. And so my, my main message here is this kind of keep questioning these assumptions to help evolve our knowledge. And an example I showed you here was at least the introduction of the missing piece of information of transverse wall shear stress. But, but, what are the buts? 
certainly the uncertainty of the data. Okay, I'd love to tell you I could take a scan or there would be such a high fidelity I could m really accurately give you the shear stress pattern and all any other quantities you want and we could connect it one to one with the, uh, the biology. We can't do that and that was my point of the slide of having the one to one point inspection, we're not at that level. It does ask us the question what level do we feel robust about? The large streaky pattern in the descending aorta, I think that was a fair, a fair objective of what we might hope to be able to good correlation with. And in the heart flow case, it's kind of a, a more macro statement about uh, whether the intervention should happen. I haven't even delved into the biological questions. What are the factors that make uh, endothelium cells unhappy or, 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 or amenable to, to, to the sort of disease process? There's studies that are now going on because we've got the transverse wall shear stress in orbital shakers. Peter has a whole lot of groups, but it makes a fluid mechanics environment that has some of these transverse properties and they can look at the association with the cells. And finally, the fluid mechanics does another thing inside the body. It mixes stuff up. You have stuff near the wall and you have stuff in the center. The swirliness of the flow can also mix that across the vessel. And so those are the other type of fluid mechanic features as we try to unfold this understanding that we might want to bring to bear on this overall problem. Okay, thank you for your attention.